Okay, good morning, everyone, and let us begin. Um, we are studying today, this week's Torah portion, Parsha Shoftim. Parsha Shoftim is uh, Devarim, Deuteronomy, Parak Zion, chapter 16, verse 18. It's page 820 if you're following in the Chumash. And this week's parsha, as is indicated by its opening verse, is Shoftim Veshoterim, the obligation of a Jewish community to have a court system with a police force to enforce the law. And uh, really the whole parsha deals with justice and um, um, a healthy civil system that is based on the rule of law. We, we open with the words Shoftim v'shoterim titen l'cha b'chol sh'arecha. Judges and officers you shall place at all of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you for your tribes, and they shall judge the people with a righteous judgment. Lo satem ishbat, you shall not uh, alter uh, the law which lehatos literally means to lean, to cause to lean or to bend. Um, lo sakir ponim, you shall not recognize a face. Velo sikach shochad, you shall not take bribery. Ki ha shochad yaver enei chachomim visalef divrei tzadikim, because bribery blinds the eyes of the wise and cuts down the words of the righteous or perverts the words of the righteous. Do not recognize a face. What does it mean to recognize a face? Don't recognize someone's face. When we are making the rule of law, it's critical that the law be blind. The law has to be uh, clear-eyed about the realities of life. Dibra, Torah, Kilshon, Bnei Adam. The Torah speaks in the language of people. That is, it is directed towards the realities of life. However, in applying the Torah, we have to be blind, not recognize an individual face. In a way, this represents, this mirrors our work when we say Shema Yisrael. When we say our daily prayers, Shema Yisrael, we close our eyes Why do we close our eyes when we say Shema Yisrael? So when a child asks me, why do we cover our eyes? So I say, look at the words. It says Shema. Listen. Hear, O Israel. And therefore we cover our eyes because we're supposed to hear and not look. A deep um, meditation pertaining to covering our eyes at Shema Yisrael. What are we saying when we say those words? The Lord, our God, God is one. And the, the meditation there is that God is present in all things. The whole world is not only a creation of God, but is part of is part of God. If God is everywhere, if God is infinite, 
If God is infinite, then God is everywhere. If God is everywhere, that means this world is with God. What happened? But the problem is that when we look with our eyes, we see realities that seem to contradict the spiritual truth that God is everywhere. So we cover our eyes so that we don't be makir panim, so that we don't recognize the external appearance of the world. Lo sakir panim. And then when we say the next verse, Baruch Shem, Kivod Malchutola Olam Vaed, blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever, we uncover our eyes for the second line. We're supposed to cover our eyes when we say Shema Yisrael and uncover our eyes for Baruch Shem. So that now that we have established firmly in our mind what is the truth, then we have to open our eyes and say, how can I make the world around me reflect that truth? So another interesting, um, another interesting truth about the Shema, if you look at the Shema as it's written in the Torah, the <laughs> word Shema has a large ayin, and the word Echad has a large dalad, as it's written in the Torah. The letter ayin and the letter dalid are a witness. Aid is a witness. And we say Shema once in the morning and once at night. Two witnesses. Verse Pasuk Yud Parak Yud Zayin, Pasuk Vav, chapter 17, verse 6, page 822. Alpi Shinayim Edim. By the word of two witnesses, we need to have two witnesses. Oshelo Sha'edi, or possibly three witnesses. What is the third witness? The third witness is the is the Shema, which is recited at bedtime, which is not technically one of the two required recitations of Shema. It is. Um, an obligation, but it's a separate obligation that a person should read the Shema before going to bed uh, so that they fall asleep um, with sacred intentions and with the word of Hashem on their lips. When the mind, when we when we're trying to go to sleep, we tend our mind tends to wander. And that's a time when a person has to be careful that they're thinking healthy thoughts. And so a good way to do that is to recite words of is to recite the Shema. And the Talmud says that a Torah scholar doesn't have to say the Shema. They could instead have words of Torah on their lips at, the, at that time. But uh, for, for the average person, the Shema is the recommended practice at bedtime. So that's why it's al Shnai Medim. Necessarily, you have to have two witnesses. But also there's a possibility of three witnesses. And these are the three witnesses, the two or three witnesses that help us establish reality, that help us establish truth, that, that determine what the real facts are. And, um, and, um, and so this is, again, with our eyes closed, because we should only listen to the Shema, we should listen to the reality, which is that Hashem, is reality itself. God is reality. And then after that, we have to keep our eyes, we have to open our eyes because we have to have the, the eyes of the, right? This is, if you read the verse, right? Verse 19 again, do not pervert the ju judgment. Don't recognize a face and don't take bribery because bribery, bribery blinds you. So if we're supposed to have uh, 
our eyes closed so that we don't recognize a face, then what's wrong with being blinded? The answer is, is that the application of judgment, the application of the judgment requires the open eyes. It's only when determining reality that we have to keep our eyes closed and only listen and not be influenced by the external appearance of things. Perhaps bribery causes us only to see the uh, external appearance and it blinds the wisdom of the eyes which is the ability to look at something and understand what it is. So we have to have enei chachamim, we have to have wise eyes. We have to have the ability to look not only at something, but into something. Los Akir Panim don't recognize a face. And a uh, story is told of, was it Reb Simcha Bunim? One Hasidic Rebbe, a poor widow came crying to him. Please Rebbe, I've been cheated and I'm poor and I have no one to speak for me. I have no one to stand up for me. Please, would you, would you hear would, you know, I need to bring this person to court who, who cheated me, who treated me badly. And her tears were so overwhelming for the Rebbe. And so he said, don't worry, we'll make a base to And he called three rabbis to form a rabbinical court. But Rabbi Simcha Bunim, how come you don't join the court? He said, because I have been bribed. Simcha Bunim, nobody gave you a cent. He said, you think that the only way to bribe somebody is with money? Sometimes tears are also bribery. How can I hear a widow's tears? How can I see a widow's tears and not have my heart moved? That is maybe the strongest form of bribery. And so I want to make sure that she gets justice, but I also know that I am not impartial. And therefore, I can't be a judge. It's, um, and so recognizing a face is important, is an important element. You have to be careful also not to, you know, we have, we have tzedakah. Tzedakah requires that we recognize a face. But in the realm of judgment, in the realm of justice, we can't have, uh, we can't be concerned with someone's identity, who they are, where they are, uh, what their lived experience is, uh, how influential they are. All of those things are, are something that blinds the eyes of, that, that are, are, um, are, are insights that are distracting and destructive to, to the words, uh, to the work of being a judge. What is the job of a judge? The job of a, this, if we, we look at this, the first verse, shoftim b'shotrim, judges and officers. We have a differentiated role here. The judge and the officer have two different jobs that exist in the same realm. The judge's job is to say, what is? The officer's job is to say what should be. So as an example, the, um, The, um, the judge of, hold on a second, let me just. Um, the job of a judge is to say what is. The job of, a, of, a, um, of an officer is to say what should be. So if we reflect again on the, 
on the the Shema and Baruch Shem um, uh, dynamic, where we close our eyes to see reality, to hear, to understand what reality should be, and then we open our eyes to to see the world around us and see how we can make that um, uh, to reflect our um, to reflect our um, uh, reflect our ideals and our, our principles, um, we have to, um, so we have to differentiate between what is and what should be. So the officer's job is to make the community abide by the reality established by the judge. The judge says, judge doesn't say what should be. The judge says this person is chayev, is liable, and this person is pater, this person is exempt. This person is righteous, this person is wicked. This, per this thing is permitted, this thing is forbidden. The words of the judge establish what reality is. And then the the officer makes that reality manifest. It, he makes it, um, he enforces any, or, or removes any obstacles to that reality being, being, um, being uh, expressed and manifest. What is the so when we once we say that the word of a judge is that the word of a judge is to establish reality, um, we can then understand some other important um, some other important verses in this in this Parsha. Um, let's look at the next verse, uh, or verse 21. Lo sita l'cho asherah kol eitz, eitzel mizbach Hashem elokecha, asher tasela. You shall not plant an asherah tree, which is a, uh, an idol, a tree which was worshipped for pagan worship. Um, a start is Ashera. Um, so we have two, two prohibitions implied in this verse. One is that it's forbidden for a person to plant a tree for pagan worship. Another is that no tree may be planted near the altar. No tree may be planted near the holy temple. So that's verse 21, yeah? Mm -hmm. Why are we not allowed to plant any tree uh, at the, near the altar? Because um, to plant a tree near the altar is to be adorning the beauty of the Holy Temple. The Holy Temple is holy and beautiful. It is a truth that does not require adornment. It doesn't, the Holy Temple doesn't need landscaping to improve its appearance. It is beautiful, it is true, it is reality itself. Reality doesn't need embellishment. Again, and not only that, once you begin to embellish reality, it is no longer reality. And so therefore the rabbis say that whoever judges, whoever receives bribery or whoever judges uh, recognizing a face who perverts justice, it is as though they have planted an Asherah. It is as though they have planted a tree for pagan worship, a shrine to a start near 
the holy temple. Which again, we can understand in this context, because since the holy temple is meant to be a manifestation of God's presence on earth, which is the ultimate reality and truth. So if we are going to adorn reality, if we're going to give landscaping to the truth, that is, we are embellishing what is perfect, that mm-hmm. that that is akin to a judge who uh, allows his judgment to follow a narrative. Because the judgment is not supposed to follow a narrative. A judgment is supposed to be uh, an expression of the unadorned and unembellished reality. No agenda and, um, and no narrative. We can, um, we can also see a similar theme at the end of the later on. So really, I, I want to say that all of this follows the, the same theme. The next verses discuss uh, the, the obligation of the court to ensure the pre- pre- prevention of idol worship infecting the Holy Land. That involves both the role of the courts as well as the obligation to uphold reality. Idol worship is an adornment to reality or is a narrative or an agenda opposed upon reality. Um, And then after that, from verse eight and on, we talk about the obligation to maintain a continuity of the court system throughout the generations. Mm -hmm. Following that, we go on to talk about the king and the king, the, the obligation of the Jewish people to have a king. And that too is an important role in the, uh, in the upholding of judge, justice. Uh, the king is kind of the executive of the community. And we talk about the obligation of him to be humble. We also then talk about the, the Levites, the Kohen and the Levi. And then we go back and forth to idol worship, which again, talks about the obligation. The Kohen and the Levi represent the people who are keeping the temple. Again, the truth and the Torah, the truth. We talk about prophecy, the difference between prophecy and um, fortune telling. Again, the difference between the narrative and the truth. However, at the end of the, um, of the, uh, of this discussion uh, regarding the courts, when we go to chapter 19, verse 14, Perak Yutet, Pasuk Yud Dalit on page 829, the very last line on the page, very last verse on the page, page, Lo tasig gevul reyacha, asher gavlu rishonim. You shall not remove your neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in your inheritance, which you shall inherit in the land that the Lord your God gives you to possess it. So this is hasogas gevul, is the prohibition against moving the fence, moving the fence of a... Um, of the boundaries of your field or your property. So everyone has a landmark, right? You have, you see it on the bottom of page 829, what? verse 14. Um, you have a fence that marks the end of your property. And you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't move the fence and in so doing, steal your neighbor's property. How does this verse uh, connect to the testimony of Shema? Anytime a person does a sin, 
anytime a person <laughs> transgresses a teaching of the Torah, they are performing Hasogas Gevul. They are moving the landmark. Because the whole world is the property of Hashem. It's God's property. And God's presence is here. And so when we are living according to God's will, then we are honoring God's ownership of the world. When we sin, when we turn away from the Torah, what we've done is we've taken a part of our world, part of the world in which we live, and we have moved God out of it. That is Hasogas Kavul, that is encroaching upon established boundaries. This is our inheritance, the ancient inheritance, the original boundaries are that the only thing, the only rights in this world is Hashem's rights. And therefore, we cannot move the marks of our boundaries. And, and again, we're relating to the job of the judge. The judge's job is to say what is, and what is is only one thing. Hashem Echad, God is one. So, and again, we reinforce this, this theme in verse 15. Edim, o edim yakum davar. The matter shall be established by the two witnesses or three, which says, go on and listen to the words of the two witnesses. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, with a large ayin and a large dalid, the witnesses. So may Hashem grant that on this month of Elul, as we approach the day of judgment, that we should recognize the truth. We should recognize reality, which is that Hashem owns us and owns this world and that we are working within his, uh, within his plan. When we close our eyes, we will see, uh, we'll see testimony, we'll see the truth. And when we, then after that, after we've established reality, we can open our eyes and make, become shoterim, become officers to make what is, should be. Another example, by the way, of the idea of blinding the eyes, is the custom of Maim Achronim. At the end of a meal, before benching, before Birkat Amazon, before saying grace after meals, the custom is to wash our fingers. Why do we wash our fingers before, uh, before doing Birkat Amazon, before doing grace after meals? So two reasons are given in halachic writings. One is that it's a holy mitzvah saying Birchat Samazon, grace after meals, and our fingers are dirty, so we shouldn't say benching with dirty fingers. Another reason is given is that there is the salt of Sodom in the food, and the salt of Sodom is blinding. So we have to wash off our fingers in case there's any salt, and that way it should, uh, if we would touch our eyes with that salt, it would blind us. So we wash our fingers before we leave the meal so to protect our eyes. Why do we do it before Birkat Tamazon? Why do we do it before grace after meals? So in order to understand that, we can go back to this idea of the blinding of the eyes of truth, which is the salt of Sodom is, um, the salt of Sodom is to tell us that when we eat, there are two ways of eating. We can either eat recognizing that God is master of the world, or we can eat like sodomites. The sodomites refused to have guests, which meant that their eating was a selfish endeavor. Of course, their food may have been kosher. 
So they were religious or orthodox, but God was not present because they wouldn't, it, it wasn't for, it, they weren't eating for God, they were eating for themselves, which meant that they refused to allow sharing. It was only selfish eating. And we have to be very careful from selfish eating because when we become selfish, when we have the salt of Sodom, which is the tastiness of food, which only serves indulging my pleasure and my selfishness, then I am unable to see with the eyes of the wise. That blinds the eyes of wisdom. Ya'aver enei chachamim. Excuse me, Rabbi? Yes, ma'am. I am not yeshiva educated. When I first started eating meals on Shabbat and Yom Tov, and they passed around the Mayim Achronim, women were bypassed. Yes. Why is that? So if we go back to the two reasons, if you eat with dirty fingers, so maybe we could say that women don't eat with their fingers, so they don't have to wash their fingers. But if their hands are dirty, you certainly should. Um, the other, the, another reason is that the obligation of your katamazon, according to some opinions, is more um, includes elements that apply to men and do, don't apply to women, because primarily the ownership of the land of Israel, the inheritance of the land of Israel, is um, is primarily. Uh, it also could include women, as we see from the story of Tzilofchad, but by default is a masculine um, domain. And since Birkat Amazon features um, the, uh, the mention of Eretz Yisrael, of the land of Israel, so uh, that's a required feature in Birkat Amazon in the grace after meals. So therefore it has a, a, a more full, it has a, a, a uh, it, it has elements that relate to the men and don't relate as much to the women. But now with, with, with this explanation in mind regarding the salt of Sodom, um, we could say, given the traditional, um, the tr traditional gender roles, the, when a woman makes food to be tasty, she is less prone to the selfishness of that taste. Um, because in, in the, in, again, in the traditional gender roles, she is cooking to share. And so therefore, the taste of the food generally, by default, has a sense of sharing and has a sense of, of uh, including others in that, um, in that, and there, there isn't, there isn't that same vulnerability to selfishness. Whereas when men eat, they are, or given the masculine um, uh, gender role, um, they're more prone to that selfish, uh, indulgent eating um, if they aren't actively going out of their way to, to push away that selfishness. So again, going back to the Sodom example, in Sodom, and Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt, the story says, right? The Midrash says, which is in Sodom, they didn't have guests. So in a, in a normal community where people are having guests, the women are the ones who prepared the food with the, with the idea that it should be tasty to include others. But the man sat at the food, sat at the table and he just enjoyed the food. And even if there are guests there, he didn't participate in that endeavor of involving the food with giving and sharing. And so he has to be more careful to uh, be mindful to make a break between his enjoying of the food and then to wipe his fingers from that. And now, and then to turn away from the vulnerability of selfishness that comes from eating, and then to turn towards Birch HaSamozon, towards grace after meals, in which he's turning towards God. 
So we have to be very careful that our religion doesn't become infected with our selfishness. Thank you very much. And on a lighter note, I offer a third reason for my Mahonim. Yeah. And that so the benches don't get so dirty. The benches don't get so dirty. Yeah. That's a, that is a, um, uh, I think there's a lot of depth in putting it in that way because it's some, it's some, it, it, uh, I think it brings together in a symbolic way all those other above mentioned themes. The bencher being a, why, why do we care if the bencher gets dirty? It's a, it's a sacred item. So we have to make sure that it doesn't become affected and infected by, uh, by our, um, gastronomical um, involvement. Good, so let's um, close our eyes and open them in the right time and place and, um, and make sure that we don't become blinded. Thank you all for joining us. Wishing everyone a Chodesh Tov, a good month and a meaningful month of Elul. And um, uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very, very much, Rabbi. The same to you and your family and my fellow students and their families. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.